What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Best Show Ever Pod, the podcast where I interview people about the best concerts they ever saw in their life. I'm your host. I'm Cam Hurt. And, you know, I feel like on every week of this podcast, every episode of this podcast, I have said this is a really special episode. And they all are. They really are all great. But this episode is uh, so truly special, so truly different. I had to put it out by itself. It had to be our grand finale for the season. Uh, this week, I have Tom Marshall um, on the podcast, longtime uh, collaborator of Trey, uh, lyricist of Fish, uh, member of the band Amphibian, um, and he's just done so much cool stuff within the community as well um, through being a podcast host on this network, Osiris, um, and, and, and championing a bunch of cool young artists. Uh, Tom was so kind through this interview. This is such a, a fun interview. We, we get to talk about Fish a little bit, um, but ultimately his, you know, his best show ever, I'm not gonna spoil it. I don't, I don't wanna spoil any of the episode with this intro here. I'm gonna get out of the way um, so you guys can listen to this awesome conversation that I had uh, with Tom Marshall. Uh, so sit back, relax, enjoy this conversation. But first, here's a little bit of music from none other than Jesus and Fartfinger. But first, first, a short break. This is the best show ever. This is the best show ever. This is the best show, the best show ever. This is the best show. The best show I ever heard. I think I have to agree. Can't, can't tell you how much I appreciate you being on, Tom. This is like so, so kind of you. Thank you. Hi, Cam. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's been up, Tom? You said you're in Asbury Park right now? Yeah, like 2019, we kind of moved here and then COVID hit and uh, we didn't get to experience the magic of Asbury Park. And it's gradually happening where there's music every night and, you know, 10 different things to do every day. And, uh, you know, we're kind of wrestling we're empty nesters or we have been for a while we're wrestling with the concept of moving here but right now this is a this is just a one bedroom that we're in right now but we're right on the ocean so it's like oh. it's amazing it's incredible i love it and all the cool stuff about asbury park is it's kind of back so i'm seeing a lot of music and and just having a lot of fun great restaurants here everything i was gonna say there's been some great music at uh, just the stone pony alone um throughout the summer but um and you've got to do a couple of those cool shows you yeah show we, with dogs in a pile and yeah exactly we had that like wacky week where it was like um two goose shows and then a tab show in the same week and before the tab show rj and i interviewed the dogs in the pile guys and uh for those of you who don't know they're kind of like an up-and-coming band i mean they're, they're they've been around for a while but they're Sort of like when you mention you're from Asbury Park or live there, that band more often than not gets mentioned these days. And they're they're young guys, and I'm very excited to see what happens next with them. Yeah, same. I, I mean, I, I was super happy to interview Brian from the band for this, um, and he has some really cool shows. If you're if you're listening to this, absolutely go listen to Brian's episode. But um, I also got to see them. Uh, out here in LA at like just a small bar called the mint. Um, and they, yeah, they just really blew me away. And it's, I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of other bands in that area too. It seems like that area just sort of breeds good music, good musicians. Uh, I agree. I think it does. And, uh, uh, this might be a secret, uh, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, a friend of mine, and I, Anthony cries on, uh, we have a, a song laying around, um, that, he, uh, Anthony was a former guitarist for spin doctors and also in my band Amphibian, uh, we had a song that's really, really upbeat and good. And, and we wrote it like 15 years ago or 10 years ago and, and we gave it to dogs in a pile. So I hope they use it. We'll see. It'd be awesome. We'd love to see what they do with that. Yep. And I hope they never tell anyone what song it is. I hope it is. I personally hope it's kept under lock and key. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you another funny thing about that is that, um, they had a song, my name of the song they had a song called that already so we had to come up with a, a different name for it so we'll see what happens wow you guys are synced up maybe you should join the band tom <laughs> i'm done with bands dude okay <laughs> you're off the road 
I'm off. No more bands for you. Mm -mm. Um, well, we've you have played some really great shows in your day. You've you've seen a lot of really great shows, but you've also been in Amphibian and and played a lot of really cool shows. But we're not here to talk about any of those today. <laughs> we're talking. We're here to talk about the ones that you've been to, uh, concerts that you've attended. I can handle that. Okay. Um, what? Uh, and speaking of, what was the first? Uh, to start everything off, before we get into your best show, I usually like to go over your first and worst show. Um, so what what was the first concert you ever saw in your life? Okay. Uh, keep in mind, I graduated uh, Princeton Day School. I went to I went there with Trey, although he graduated from Taft. Uh, I graduated high school in 1982. So with that in mind, um, in 1977 in Alexander Hall, and remember that venue name, because it comes into play later. Um, um, I saw Jean-Luc Ponty. And he's a cool. jazz, yeah, you might know him, an electric violinist dude who had played with um, uh, Zappa, Elton John, and uh, Stanley Clark, those kind of people, John McLaughlin. Um, and yeah. he was amazing. And I remember a uh, highlight of that show was him walking back and tripping over a monitor and breaking a beautiful violin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. You saw the last performance of that violin. <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> oh no. Was that a show that you um went to by yourself? Did you go with friends or I, I went with my friend Phil Parado to that and uh then Phil moved to Canada. Well, a, a lot later, but he's in Canada. I haven't seen him in a long time, but so he took me to my first like cool show that I, you know, didn't go to the circus or something with my parents. So that that felt like a start. Right. And then very shortly after that uh, my first rock show was Boston, the band Boston. Oh, nice. In 1979, Sammy Hagar opened, and that was at Jadwin Gym in um, in Princeton, New Jersey, on the campus. And uh, that place, um, it was kind of like that gym was pretty new, and it was named after uh, a, a student there, a rich family, um, donated it. And it was kind of like, think of like the opera the you know the australia the sydney opera house but without all the sharp curves more round and uh uh it it was a beautiful place and i think the collective weight uh on the main floor fucked it up and that was the last concert they had there oh no <laughs> yeah so it was like the first and last i did see james taylor there but that they figured the old people watching james taylor weren't, weren't going to bounce around so they were not a lot of chill. jumping <laughs> Not a lot of jumping at the James Taylor show, but I'm sure Boston in that in that era that had to be a packed out. That was that a tough ticket to get. I'm sure people were clamoring for that. Yeah, back then for a twelve dollar ticket, there's you know people lined up around the block. <laughs> it was a uh, it was really good. Brad Delp uh, was the singer, and I remember he was like uh, like the coolest thing I'd ever seen because he was like the first rock star that I was you know, within, within reach of, and, uh, their music was all over the radio. And so yeah. this was like a genuine, like the genuine article in front of me kind of for the first time. Uh, then I saw Dave, uh, Dave Mason at Dillon gym, another gym on Princeton campus, 1980. And then, uh, with Trey, uh, started seeing a whole lot of, uh, Pat Metheny, uh, 1980, 1981. And this was when we started having a band and, and we we're writing stuff together and doing some stuff. And I was like a synthesizer head. Um, all the things that tri that Paige plays now, the, you know, the sequential circuits and Moog boards that he has, those were all like new back then. And I, they were all too expensive for me to, to afford probably Paige back then too. And uh, so I would drool over that kind of equipment. But the, the crown jewel of keyboard technology at the time was called a synclavier. And it was made by a company called New England Digital in Vermont. Um, and uh, uh, Pat Metheny uh, and his keyboardist Lyle May is used a synclavier. And so it's like cool. the apps and, and the album's called Off Ramp that they were touring at the time. And uh, there's a song in there called Are You Going, Are You Going With Me? And you can hear he, he, uh, Pat's guitar first because he's using a controller uh for the for the synthesizer too so he and lyle mays is playing the actual keyboard but but um pat Metheny on his guitar is also playing the synclavier and so wow all these crazy sounds are coming out of this guitar and it was the first uh time that you know i'd, I'd seen like a a guitar a keyboard controlled by the guitar or a synthesizer controlled by a guitar and it was uh 
I guess all the other guitar controllers sucked at the time, but this one was like spot on for someone, uh, you know, as good and fast as Pat Metheny to use live on stage. So it was like a technology fest for young musicians uh, or, or, you know, young band wannabes like me and Trey at the time. Um, but especially for me because of, of the keyboard technology. But this song, Are You Going With Me? He starts out in a sort of a harmonica patch and then it kicks in when he goes to trumpet. So check that out. You'll like it. It's on the album off ramp. I'm, I'm oh. sure there was a level. I, I, oh, go sorry. Ahead. I was going to, no, you, you go <laughs> ahead. Cause you're talking about that show still. Uh, well, I just, uh, you know, with all the cool equipment, I mean, especially in that time where things are kind of like breaking through and there's new ground on cool equipment and new sounds, I'm sure there's a level of like you guys being musicians going back to your dorm or wherever you were living at the time being like, oh man, all I got is, all I got is what I got. I wish I could make those sounds I heard tonight, you know? And, incredible sounds yeah exactly they're and they're like unattainable sounds back then now you can plug in garage band and have exactly those sounds but yeah. but you know we, kids don't know what they have these days <laughs> um, <laughs> um and i have to mention um seeing the dead uh you know the real dead with jerry um i went at least once with trey to msg but the one that i remember the most was at rfk uh in dc I don't know if that stadium yeah. has has uh, shows anymore, but um, went with Trey and Peter Catoni, a drummer friend of ours, and that was uh, July um, 1986. And Dylan and Tom Petty opened, and it was oh it my was, god, yeah, it was incredible. And it was so hot that fire hoses were like on the whole time, just shooting out into the audience, and we got <laughs> way, way, way up. And it was like me, Trey, and Peter, and we were dripping sweat, and then all of a sudden bodies started being passed over us uh people that had fainted oh and, my god and we were just hand like ragdoll women we were it was primarily women at, at least the ones that i helped uh transport to the security um in between the the, the audience and the band uh in that little pit and they would walk them out i guess to the ambulance presumably to rehydrate and um i remember trey saying uh you just don't want to be one of those like when a body went over <laughs> yeah. you, do, you do not i i i truly have been one of those when i was in high school i, I i'm prone to fainting i'm prone to passing out even if i'm not on any sort of substances or anything and so i remember feeling those same things going to shows when i was younger being squeezed in and being like well as long as i don't pass out and then the next moment <laughs> being the guy getting put over the railing but yeah what a i mean that show gets referenced as you know like a turning point for the band because i I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the show jerry goes into a, a coma after that because it was oh. so hot at rfk oh my god that's six or yeah july 6 1986 was the show date so yeah i i'm not my dead history isn't all that great but uh yeah. it's, it sounds right actually it was very very <laughs> incredibly hot oh man what a scene i'm sure what an incredible yeah. scene i'm sure yeah a little frightful was. but also incredible <laughs> frightful and incredible and you're not gonna faint are you i'm gonna be fine <laughs> i'm actually feeling great right now <laughs> okay good, good. <laughs> <laughs> i um i'm very excited about the interview but i'm not gonna faint so no no <laughs> i can't help no. you i'm in new jersey and you're in california so you're on your own hey if it happens i'll keep it rolling that's what i'll post it'll we just keep be... it rolling me we keep it rolling on this side <laughs> that's right um and now you know you don't have to put any artists down too horribly if you don't want to you don't even have to mention them by name if you don't want but is there a do you have a, like a worst concert experience that sticks out in your head i don't really have a worst uh just well th this is sort of like this is almost not fair because he died recently but I believe this, the fact that this concert was terrible, didn't have anything to do with the sickness or, or what eventually killed him. But Gordon Lightfoot died recently, but I went and saw him like five years ago. I think it was like, it was at the Jersey shore. It was around here somewhere, ocean city, I think. And, um, it might've been 2018 and he kind of scared, I think everybody just mm. by not he kind of didn't show up for the show it was really kind of awkward and, and awful and pathetic and uh yeah. so that, that and that that's probably that's not fair kind of picking on an older dude who has to like make ends meet and still tour past their prime which is sort of sad but that was really right. sort of like yeah it, that didn't feel good that show and that was like my first time i really like walked away like 
what the hell did we just see? Um, Coventry, <laughs> I think it was probably my worst show experience. Yeah. August 2004, sure. kind of a terrible experience, but not only muddy and awful in every way, uh, but watching my my friend's worst performance ever uh, wasn't ideal. I left after after the first day. Okay, that was, that yeah. was terrible. I can only imagine. I mean, like that. Uh, so many people have so many feelings about that weekend and and those shows and um, you know the way things were looking at that time and um, being friends with those guys. Yeah, I'm sure there was a level of um, pretty deep sadness that weekend. I'm sure that there's kind of nothing that can touch that for you, you know? I mean, on top of the sadness that it was going to be, you know, this thing that I had kind of nurtured or been part of my whole life uh, being kind of put to rest, uh, then the other kind of bad stuff that happened, like that wasn't anticipated. And it was just, you know, yeah. and on, on top of that, the the horrible weather incident, you know, it was just like everything combined as just, that was a terrible, terrible uh show for me uh for for a lot of people um a runner-up for worst concert experience though uh was the 420 fest in atlanta i, I moved down there uh 2014 or 2015 i'd moved down there for like a two-year work thing and i think it was like anders osborne and steel pulse uh cage the elephant um uh who was that band that played uh oh galactic they were all there and i was like excited and everything was great and i was about to meet a friend of mine who was had a a new company and her booth was there and I just made a friend in Atlanta and I was excited to go to a show with her not knowing her very well and I think she got the wrong idea or something and I because I saw her working in her booth and sort of waited patiently till there was no one around and I walked up and in front of like all her co-workers and some other people walking by she started just yelling at me and it was oh. like it was unhinged it was very unusual and it fucked oh, no. me up yeah it was like just screaming at me like what the fuck are you doing here i'm working yeah it was like it was really like and i'm like i didn't want to say her name oh. i almost i almost just said her name yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> and i was like person um we agreed to meet here we're gonna see the show and she just screamed so i kind of like walked away in a daze and sat down on the uh on this beautiful like bowl grass and decided to let the sun soak me i think there was a band playing way down there maybe steel pulse it was reggae-ish and i was like you know i can maybe kind of bounce back and find some people i know maybe and and uh all of a sudden i was like oh things are really looking up a pretty girl kind of walked toward me and then sat down right next to me and i was like oh this is interesting and then she turned and threw up all over me and oh, no. yeah yeah <laughs> So, and then to make matters even worse, I walked out. I'm like, all right, this fucking sucks. And I walked out, but I walked out on the wrong side of Centennial Park, which is a 200 acre park. And, it, and they wouldn't let me back in. I said, my car's right over on the other side. And they're like, fuck you, dude, later. And I had to walk like oh six miles. I had to walk six miles with throw up on me, vomit on me to my car. And I had to go all the way around the park. Yeah. Wow. Anyway. So when I when I when I said nothing else could touch Coventry, you're like, well, you know, I there's that. another, <laughs> there's, there's one other one. But that, that one wasn't like the, there was no bad music, as far as I know. There was no bad music. Yeah, just a lot to bounce back from. God, it sounds like an episode of a like a TV show, like a comedy. It's like things are finally going to look up. Hey, pretty girl coming my way. Yeah. Pretty nice. Yeah. Reggae song <laughs> and just like record scratch. <laughs> It was a total record scratch day. I can't even believe I like stayed in Atlanta after that. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot to get over. Yeah. That's man. That's crazy. Well, and that's not any artist's fault. <laughs> you didn't right. put down any artist's name. Uh, th th there's a lot going on with that story. <laughs> um, man. Well, you know, you, and the other thing is Tom, you get like this nice, um, it's, it's, pr it's probably a nice back and forth for you where people do know who you are. People see you and probably get really excited to, to meet Tom Marshall or be around Tom Marshall. But then there's also, I'm sure, times that you want to be at shows by yourself or maybe just with one other person, not bumping into folks. But um, I mean, do, do you think that your concert going experience has changed at all, you know, just in the last maybe 10 years or so with like Fish being you know, back in the consciousness and you having a podcast being a little bit more um, out there, forward facing. Yeah, out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, 
now going to like a Bruce Springsteen show, like 10 people will recognize me now, which is, you know, completely different fan base. And yet it, it happens, which is kind of cool. Also at Bruce Springsteen, yeah. like my wife and I'll notice like you can go away and bring back beers to your seat and the, without spilling them because you haven't bumped into 600 people and the aisles are clear and uh, your seats are empty when you get back there. <laughs> it's kind like, of a novel well, idea yeah. in our world. <laughs> it's outrageous. It's like, wow, you know, fish, fish should figure this out. This is really interesting. And you're allowed to sit down, which is even more interesting for me these days. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this. I think that that's getting a little bit more okay. I, I feel like there are people who are a little bit more okay with people sitting down at fish shows nowadays. But yeah, the, the aisle... I don't think we'll ever be clear. Those guys can play till they're 90 and <laughs> the aisle is going to be packed up. Are you saying with the collective age of the audience, slightly average age increasing that sitting down is sort of less frowned upon? It, it, it could absolutely be that. Um, but it's also, I feel like I've just gone to some shows recently and um, like I went to the Hollywood bowl run in the spring, um, which were fantastic shows. And you know, when the band would bring, you know the show down a little bit and and kind of pull into like a smaller or a, a a quieter or slower song more of a ballad i would notice like my whole section would kind of take a seat you know and the bowl is a beautiful place to do that you know it's incredible views you've got the benches with you um and so it's it's not a bad place to do it um i don't think it's a bad I just, thing either i i, I agree yeah. i totally agree with people sitting down i think that's kind of what the seats are for right <laughs> yeah <laughs> And, and oftentimes we're doing three day weekends, you know, yeah. or four, seven yeah. day, you know, seven show runs or something. Take a seat, you know, how about that? How about that? Seven, seven show run recently. That was so incredibly good that, uh, so Friday, good. Friday, um, August 4th, uh, MSG was stellar. The Mike, Mike sand, uh, cross eyed. Um, but my, my moment, my special moment was being next to Dan Cantor for, uh, while my guitar gently weeps. And oh, he yeah. just turned to me and said, George, <laughs> it was yep. like, yeah, it was uh, awesome. Amazing. I, I was, I was, I was sitting at home pulling my hair out, uh, <laughs> <laughs> missing those shows. I was like, oh no, but I mean, it was the same, same thing, uh, out here on the West coast for the spring tour. I, you know, I've never done a six day and or six shows and seven day run with the band at the same time doing all of the shows. And, you know, by the fourth day I'm spent, you know, <laughs> I'm completely spent. And I'm 31, you know, and I am not playing the show and I'm not doing any math in my head about anything that's going on. Those guys are upstate on stage doing calculus and also, you know, <laughs> doing a whole show for us. It's it's pretty amazing. Uh, the Incredible. stamina those guys have through these long runs. Yeah, it's, yes. it's pretty awesome to watch. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, but let's get into some of your best shows here. I know it's, it's very difficult to pick your best show ever. You've seen so many shows. And so um, I like to do honorable mentions in here. Do you have some shows that you would be remiss if you didn't bring up? Yeah. Well, so there's two categories for me. It's like fish and non-fish. I decided I would do right. non non-fish for this uh, interview. Um, but um, I would be remiss not saying, because especially since I mentioned Coventry, that its entire polar opposite show is Big Cypress. Uh, and yes. so like Co Coventry, everything went wrong. And uh, Big Cypress, everything went went right. It was like so oh. perfectly perfect, it's hard to imagine. So for me, it was like peak music, peak life, uh, perfect friends set, perfect music, perfect location, that all night set, jetting in there and out with the band. I mean, it was like, yeah. Yeah, it was so good. But so that to me is probably, you know, an answer to the question, best show ever. Yes, that's it for me. But but honorable mentions. Um, oh, oh, and that's not the one that I'm going to use as my best show for for your when you ask me the question. Um, but <laughs> an, the honorable mention that I was tossing around for best show was um, October 30th, 1987, Lundfontein Theater on Broadway, Jerry Garcia Band. I went with my pal, cool. John Sproul, not knowing a whole lot about the Jerry Garcia band. Um, we had front row center balcony um, and it was a beautiful small theater. So we were like right looking down on uh, John Kahn, who's like this legendary, you probably know, legendary bass player, a friend of, of Jerry's. He smoked as he played a cigarette from the center of his mouth 
uh it was just <laughs> it was so cool it was just i'd never seen anything like it and then he would take it out and put it in his guitar you know like robbie robertson uh but it was like it, it he was amazing and he was a great bass player and the show was like opened acoustic and then went electric and uh john Kahn was i think the the bleed over i think he and jerry were the two that were in both sets but john Kahn uh in the acoustic played an upright and then he played electric obviously during the electric wow. set and it was it was really probably my favorite or tied for favorite for my non-fish favorite show yeah you to get both those bass sensibilities in the same show from the same bassist um it's it's fun to watch either one but to watch them do both and then also that center that center cigarette smoke that's like how a cowboy smokes a cigarette you know like that's such a cowboy <laughs> move. I, I i hadn't seen it and i thought it was kind of like the coolest thing yeah ever it i don't is. know i don't know why but yeah why do why don't only cowboys know how to do that <laughs> i don't know i don't smoke cigarettes and i not that makes me want to kind of have one to be honest if i next see you with a cigarette it better be right dead center it's gonna be right in the middle I'm gonna <laughs> tap, my cat tipped yeah <laughs> um incredible yeah so that that for sure um big cypress um i have some fish honorable mentions uh the meat stick new year's gag uh yeah. was just delightful uh 2010 new year's um and, and I was with a delighted family, uh, just laughing the whole time with my my son and daughter and my and my wife. Funnest, funniest time with my family at a show by far. And then uh, David Bowie, uh, Ziggy Stardust Halloween in Vegas. And I think the moment it hit me, well, first of all, that's like one of my favorite albums ever, ever, ever. But Trey yeah. singing Rock and Roll Suicide with that jacket. <laughs> And he put down yeah. his guitar and came out with like, you know, paid style coming out with like the, just the mic and the yeah. strings and the backup singers. It was overwhelming. It was just unbelievable for that moment. Also, uh, I want to mention how happy the um, the celloist was. I believe that yeah. there was a woman that everyone met, like commented on later that night. She was just having <laughs> such a good time and it made everyone have a good time. It was incredible. It was incredible. I love that. So that's kind of, those are my honorable mentions. I mean, you get to watch your buddy be a rock star all the time in exactly his fashion, you know, like in exactly his way. And, you know, to see him step away, take the guitar off, have some costume on, you know, be a little vulnerable on the mic by himself. I'm sure that was just like, you know, a, a refresh of like, look at how big of a rock star this guy is. It's incredible, you know? At that moment, huge, huge, huge rock star. Well, anytime he's on stage, front and center at MSG, right? That, I mean. yeah yeah incredible <laughs> but uh so that also, was in Ve that was in vegas and that was like that was more of a show right because it had like yeah. all that other stuff it was incredible yeah it's it's fun when they get to you know flex their production value uh artist <laughs> yeah. uh, artistic uh sensibilities also you know seeing that show with your family you know in 2010 you know we, they had really only been back for a year or so and you had had this whole journey with your friends, you had this whole journey with your your buddies. And was there a moment in that show where you're like, no, nah, it's going to be a new journey. Now I've got my family here with me. We're, la we're laughing about the, the songs. And um, I'm sure that was a completely different experience. It was like in, in that uh, in their hiatus, my daughter and wife had become massive, massive fish heads like it, cool. it it was incredible so this was like you said kind of one of our first shows we've all gone to together and yeah so you're right there was probably some like kind of emotional thing happening in there where it's like wow oh, cool i can enjoy this with my family now too yeah yeah it's it's so fun to watch families be there at the shows together it's you know of course it's nice to be there with your buddies and have a big like boys weekend and, and yeah. get away but it's also it's it's fun to watch families dancing together and quoting the lyrics and high-fiving all that kind of stuff i'd been i've been um, like boys clubbing it for uh 1.0 and 2.0 so 3.0 now it's totally uh it's switched over it's all about the family i feel like that's also reflected in the in the lyrics you know we don't have to get too far into your your lyrics here but i i feel like that's completely influenced the way that you and trey write together as well i i completely believe that that's the case yes yeah um but none of those shows are your best show ever. Well, kind of. So Big Cypress, kind of. But um, what to get into your best show ever, do you have 
a best show that you've ever seen yeah and i was thinking like how do i how how do i kind of build the background correctly to make you understand uh kind of what i'm talking about and why this hits so hard the only way i can do it is just fill in a tiny bit of my my history so the the show yeah. is king crimson in alexander hall in princeton new jersey oh um and it was march 6 1982. um oh. now the band was adrian Ballou, robert fripp tony levin and bill bruford so yeah. at the time remember i'm 18. uh yeah 18 i think trey's 17. um trey listened to all music but i was going down a progressive rock rabbit hole I mean, I was fully in a progressive with my two favorite bands uh, being Yes and Genesis. But Genesis, oh, yes. but Genesis with Peter Gabriel, that's important. Right. Phil right. Collins was behind the drum set where he belongs. Um, but <laughs> he's a great drummer, but he, he, he should have stayed there because once Genesis had Phil Collins as a front man, it changed and became something that wasn't Genesis to me. But anyway, and and you know when i say they're my two favorite bands this is apart from beatles pink floyd and led zeppelin who are my triumvirate favorite of all time um but um so uh their best album and peter gabriel's last album with genesis is a masterpiece called lamb lies down on broadway which came out in 1974 and that has brian east brian eno as a producer or co-producer or something his name's on there but that name sort of because of that started rotating through my head and I realized, um, uh, well, I'll bring up Brian Eno a little bit later in a moment, but when Gabriel left to have a solo career, um, his bass player was this tall, gorky, bald guy named Tony Levin who played a Chapman, yeah. Chapman stick, which is like this eight string bass. I think it goes up, it's strung up into the guitar range and I think it goes below normal bass range and it's, like impossible to learn how to play. You play by hammering on. And he was a prodigy at it. He was amazing at it. And it sounds incredible. He's so incredible that like, you know, Michael Jackson used him for, for songs as the, his studio bassist. He, 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 he's all over, but anyway, Tony Levin at the time, my favorite bass player. Now, uh, as I was saying, as you go down the progressive rock rabbit hole, the same names keep coming up like David Bowie, of course, and producer Steve Lillywhite, who eventually produced some of Fish's albums um yeah. billy breathes notably um and brian eno and and brian eno i just have to say made an impression on me and trey like not just an impression like a meteor crater in my skull impression um he is and was my god and, but his go-to guitarist was robert fripp robert fripp yeah. also played with bowie and gabriel um but fripp's real band is king crimson and king crimson never had the same lineup once Ever. it's yeah, yeah it, really. but it always has robert fripp because he it's his band now i could go on yeah. forever but with that groundwork laid i can explain why this king crimson concert had the ultimate lineup for 18 year old tom and 17 year old trey um because well I'm, I'm so i'm so glad you did because that lineup is one of my favorite king crimson lineups especially i'm so glad you mentioned tony levin if if you don't listen to King Crimson or if you haven't there's some great live footage of them playing in in France at the in 1982 this exact lineup of of members full show is on YouTube please go watch that show and Tony Levin is incredible to watch yes this lineup um the first of three albums uh with this lineup was discipline it was discipline beat and three of a perfect pair and then the then King Crimson changed again but um discipline uh completely blew me away and blew my friends away and my guitar playing friends, David Abrahams and Trey Anastasio. Um, and uh, so uh, Eno at the time, back to Eno, was produced, also producing a band called Talking Heads. <laughs> um, and their flat, flagship masterwork album had just come out in 1980, which is Remain in Light. And uh, the gu guitarist for that was Adrian Ballou. So I'll summarize this in a second, but this is all the stuff Trey and I were listening to at the time, which made it more miraculous that this band suddenly showed up in Princeton at the, the theater we'd seen Pat Metheny in, Alexander Hall, which is now called Richardson Hall, uh, on Princeton yeah. campus. Um, and then lastly, Trey and I listened to Yes, We Loved, uh, Close to the Edge, the album Close to the Edge. Um, and uh, the best lineup for that band, which is also s sort of rotating, um, 
was for the albums uh, Fragile and Close to the Edge. And that features one of the best drummers, my favorite drummer by far at the time, Bill Bruford. And right. so this version of King Crimson was Robert Fripp, because it's his band, Tony Levin on bass or stick from Peter Gabriel's band, Adrian Ballou from Talking Heads and Bill Bruford from Yes. And it was like a wet dream for, for me personally, because oh, yeah. it was all my favorite stuff. And of course they brought it and we were just, you know, chin drop the whole, whole time, jaw drop on chin, the whole, whole show. Trey, I looked at him like he was riveted. My friend David was riveted. My friend Peter Catoni was riveted. We never looked away. And it was like the most overwhelming tidal wave of music and sound ever, ever, ever for me. Yeah, some of those arrangements of, you know, really great musicians are, uh, they're not always exactly what you would like. They're not, yes, you know, they're not Genesis. If you, you know, if you go see like Asia or something like that, that <laughs> they're great. They're a great, you know, group of a lot of those same musicians from a lot of those same bands, but it's a different, it, yeah. it hardly ever works really to be, you know, to be frank. And King Crimson is just so, their improvisation is so unbelievable. Um, and it's so fast um, and there's so many notes and then there's also room to breathe it, yeah they're they're really incredible was there is that a was that a two set show or was that a one not, they just played they just played out, out the whole album um they yeah. put in two two songs from they opened with discipline which the album opens with and the album's titled and that is was just a sort of a a masterpiece of being able to sync up with your bandmates Listen to that song, Discipline, if you don't listen to anything else that I've mentioned. Um, yeah. Listen to that song and you'll hear. And imagine seeing it right up close with two guitar masters, Fripp and, and Baloo, uh, playing. And then and then Tony and, and then Bill Bruford, the, the drum master. Um, it was incredible. But they played two songs from the old days of Crimson. And I was, by this time, a Crimson head. Um, they played Red from the album Red. And they also played Lark's Tongues in Aspect Part 2 from my favorite King Crimson album called Lark's Tongues in Aspic. So those were the two old ones. And then everything else was new. I am I am so certain that right now my dad is somewhere listening to this episode, just fist pumping. He lo he loves King Crimson. He loves, yes, he loves Genesis. He's probably so excited that um, this stuff gets Hi. talked about. And this is just great musical education, uh, great root. You know, if you love improvisational music, I, this is truly some of the best ever done, you know. First of all, hi, Mr. Hurt, right? That's your dad. <laughs> That's right. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I have to say another important thing about this place. So um, that place, because we'd seen, I'd seen Jean-Luc Ponty there, and then Trey and I saw Pat Metheny there twice. Um, Alexander Hall at the time, now called Richardson Auditorium, is sort of like a round citadel, church-like, old, beautiful Princeton University, Princeton campus. Uh, building, stunning round theater, beautiful, beautiful old uh, building, incredible. And uh, like the, you know, the architecture itself is a masterpiece, but the music inside <laughs> is even more so. And uh, yeah. Trey turned to me and said, I'm going to play here someday. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, I'll, and I'll join you. And uh, I will say he made good on his word because November 18th, 2010, uh, Trey toured with the Scorchio Quartet. It was an acoustic with uh, uh, violin, viola, cello, and upright bass. And they did a bunch of like fish songs and Trey songs. And they played at, wouldn't you know it, Alexander Hall, Richardson Auditorium. And Trey invited me on and we did Strange Design. And so that was like, that was a moment for us and me. And he, Trey even brought up an old story how we used to like hang around Princeton campus and especially ha hang out. And we wrote glide in the sculpture that was right outside uh, that time. Wow. Yes. <laughs> there has to be, a, a, I mean, there's so many um, spots throughout the, the East coast and through Vermont and through, um, you know, you guys is, uh, you know, growing up together that it, there has to be this feeling of like, I can't believe some of the stuff that we manifested through this time i cannot believe some of the stuff that we laughed about like oh that would be that would be cool to do something like that and then it ends up happening um i mean in that time when you're when you're seeing shows and you know you guys are writing music together and you know trey is 
starting to get into fish and, and all that kind of stuff. How, how much did that music, um, you know, especially like the um, King Crimson and um, Talking Heads, how, how much did that influence like the way that you guys, I mean, it sounds like such a contrived question, but how much did it you know, influence the way that you guys um, decided to work? You know, you guys work in such a very specific way um, my, as my, those fans do. I, I think I think I can like sort of see a direct line from it to to Trey because he's the you know, he's the guy on stage and stuff like, for example, you know, I would always see him. He would always sort of assume that he was going to be a guitar player on stage. I don't think he ever necessarily thought he would be as big as as he is or as as fish is yeah. but i think he knew he'd be doing it always so um but you know he would say things like to me that were sort of ridiculous at the time and then they came true like that one i was telling you we're gonna play here someday i'm like yeah and then another was listening to um with my friend mark daubert at trey's dad's uh, uh condo listening to close to the edge and that song the song close to the edge has an, a very involved beginning and then when the band kicks in it's like with this Chris Squire bass line that's just one note, but it's ding, 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 ding. And then the, the, the music starts and it's so beautiful after this kind of chaotic beginning that, uh, you know, we were in a bliss, Mark and me, and then Trey ran up and pulled the needle off the, the album and said, we can do this. <laughs> and Mark, Mark and I laughed, like, it was so absurd. Like, yeah, like, like right had, now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But not just that, more just like like assuming that, you know, saying that you can create something on par with at the time was the most genius song or music that I'd ever heard in my life. And especially at that moment and ripping off the, 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 the needle to say it was just it's hilarious. But every single one of the festivals uh, started as a we should do this and the other guys laughing. You know what I mean? So Trey, and, and it's always that way with Trey. It's like, oh my God, wouldn't it be amazing if blank and that becomes a Halloween idea or right. we should, we should write a song about X and then that becomes, you know, the next fish song. So it's, yeah, it's, it, it, they all start as a concept. So everyone got used to that with Trey. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, um, in, in hearing you guys talk in the past on under the scales and, um, uh, other other podcasts that you guys have done together if you if you guys listening have not heard those episodes there's some really great under the scales episodes where tom and and trey talk about their process back in the day but you you bring up that there's no ego ever between you two you bring up that there there was not an ego and um nothing was too precious but it it doesn't that doesn't mean a lack of confidence that doesn't mean a lack of like foresight or, or faith in yourself that means just get out of the way and let people help you. And, you know, you've got a great community and things like that, but um, yeah, it really does. It means, it means not being embarrassed to add something to something that's already pretty good or, or, you know, mention that you don't like something that the other guy likes or, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you can easily insult someone in a collaborative process if they're not the perfect collaborator. So I, you know, I found like in my life, like four perfect collaborator songwriter types that we just mesh and it, they all share that, that quality where no idea is bad, you know? Yeah. It takes, it takes both parties to do that. It, and, um, to do it within a group is even harder. You know, um, a lot of the, um, you know, art that I've made in my life is comedy and a lot of it comes in the, the improv space. And so you do that as a group or you write a sketch as a group or you do a sketch show as a group. And it is so hard to get eight brains to agree that this is how it should be or, or eight brains to, you know, see the same vision that the one that one person is talking about. And it seems like, uh, you know, obviously there's a vision from any one of you guys, whether it's lyrics or whether it's a big festival or things like that. But it also takes the other members of the band saying yes um, and maybe laughing and thinking it's ridiculous, but also being like, all right, well, let's let's get to work on this. You know, it's a different type of collaboration. Like Trey, once the song is written, Trey's real work begins where he's got to collaborate with every band member. And we saw a little bit of his process uh, in uh, Between Me and My Mind uh, where he. Yeah kind of shops a song around to everyone, but he's like, 
that involves him like driving to Vermont to hang out with Paige, driving to Maine to hang out with Fish, and uh, you know, going going to Mike's house and and everyone adding their thing to it to to feel that it's it, it's theirs. It's become a little bit more of a process, and and it falls on Trey's shoulders a, a, a lot to do that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, but there's now there's so many songs, and it's so hard for a song to to become a fish song that uh, yeah. he's got to do that work. Yeah. So I'm just lucky I have uh, Evolve, um, The Well, and uh, Oblivion in this current current batch of new songs. I'm so honored and excited about them. Gosh, I love those songs. I, I really do. Um, I didn't. I didn't listen to the shows where he was at Mission Ballroom with with Desron and and Fishman, and I missed those those songs. And then when he busts them out with Fish, I mean, those songs are incredible. And uh, it oh. still speaks to you know, uh, it's really really hard to keep things going and to keep uh, keep things fresh and inspired. But um, just like other great bands, um, like you know, like Rush and you know, they they made music all the way through the end of their run. They were making really great albums that they would tour with along with, you know, 2112 and all that stuff. And you guys are still able to to do that. Do you feel like there's like a. It's do you think that's easier to do now or do, do things just kind of happen or. Uh, recognizing that it's unique, uh, I wouldn't have come up with Rush as an example of. But but you're right. It's like if you go see a Rolling Stones show and mick says okay and here's a new song half of the people will go up to the bathroom no one cares what they're doing what they're writing now uh to yeah. have a fan base that cares what you're writing is is magic and trey uh mm. is so grateful for it and tells me all the time that it's you know they have a very unique situation where people are interested in the new songs so uh i love it i mean of course it's great yeah. for me because that's my that's my way of contributing to current fish is or staying current myself i guess for sure i mean are there things that you're you do to stay current or is there music that you're listening to or that you feel like is inspired or inspires you i mean like i said asbury park so i'm seeing a lot of music um i'm interested in you know kind of giving songs or or writing music with other people like i was just in the studio for two days with uh cal kehoe who is a guitarist for Pink Talking Fish. Um, but he's yeah. kind of like, he's ready to branch out on his own. He's got an amazing band. And uh, we just wrote two songs together, which uh, I, I really love. And then Anthony Kryzon and I, Anthony has a studio, so he's a professional studio dude. Um, but he and I keep writing always. And then writing with Trey and watching Fish continue to evolve. And then, you know, keeping tabs on bands like like Goose, who, whom I'm friends with, and uh, Dogs in a Pile, whom I'm very grateful to be, you know, very close to now. Uh, so that's kind of how I'm staying, staying in it. Yeah, we're lucky that we've got great bands that are putting out great music right now. Um, we're in a good spot. The scene seems so great. Yeah, it feels yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, Tom, I don't, I don't want to hold you too long. I'm, I'm so uh, thankful that you did the episode. I mean, the. The art that you've made and the way that you've done it in your life has been so deeply inspirational to me and, you know, uh, the way that I make art and, and things like that. And so um, you taking the time just means uh, the world to me. Uh, do you do you have anything coming up that you're excited about? Any any shows that you're about to see that you're looking forward to? Uh, well, I've been recovering from COVID. Yeah, I got the MSG-19. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, uh, uh, yeah, coming up um, at the moment, like I, I canceled Dick's kind of because I was like, I, I got overwhelmed by by the MSG and getting sick and stuff and was worried enough to cancel Dick's. Uh, there was another, yeah. th there's other, like there's a family reason to cancel as well. But um, mm. right now it's really just writing, just writing songs. Uh, you know, I think, although there's no, I'm not making any kind of announcement, but when Trey starts gathering a bunch of new songs, there's always a possibility of an album being talked about. It hasn't been talked about, but I'm kind of bracing for that. And I have some new stuff that Trey hasn't heard yet. And uh, I want to be there uh, when when he says, do you have anything new ready to go, Tom? Like, just so happens, you know. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. 
Well, when that day comes, let him know. I've got a couple songs I've been working on as well <laughs> that I would love to. <laughs> no, Perfect. you don't want my music. I I'll, 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 I can provide jokes. You do not want my songs, that's for sure. <laughs> we'll start, start the album with a joke. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That'll be good. Uh, thanks so much, Tom. That was the best show ever. That was the best show ever. That was the best show, the best show ever. That was the best show. Man, there was fucked up stuff in there. Yeah, what the fuck was that about? Hey, well, that was a little bit of music from Jesus and Fartfinger, of course, uh, but also just an incredible conversation uh, with Tom. It, it was so kind of him to to come on and, and do the show with me. I've got so many people to thank for this happening, Tom being one of them, uh, RJ from Osiris and Osiris, the whole family kind of helping this get set up here. Um, I want to thank my older brother and my younger brother for getting me into fish, uh, Kyle and Kellen. Um, and for all the people who encouraged me along the the journey of this this podcast, uh, this is the end of season one. If you if you listen through this whole episode and you're you're listening right now and you haven't heard the other episodes of this podcast, please go back and listen to those episodes. There's some just awesome conversations with great musicians, uh, great friends, cool people from the community, um, and I have had just a blast doing these episodes and putting them out. And so. Um, Follow Best Show Ever on Instagram. Uh, look out for anything coming out from Tom. Uh, the Undermine Podcast is an incredible podcast here on this family of podcasts, the Osiris Network. Um, I, look, look out for all that cool stuff. There's a bunch of cool stuff happening. If you see Tom at a show, tell him hi. Uh, he was an incredible interview and an incredibly nice guy to have on. He's funny, too. Come on. What more could you ask for out of a guest? unbelievable um that's it for season one guys thank you so much for listening uh keep keep in touch keep it in tune for the second season of this to come out soon hopefully we'll, we'll see what happens but until next time guys have a great show <laughs>